Sir Weginald, the wedge-tailed eagle, should be soaring the thermals high in the sky, as free as a bird. But instead, he's recuperating after his left wing was seriously damaged a couple of months ago. What actually happened to him? He's so beautiful and regal. When we examined him, we found that he had a gunshot wound in his left forearm. Oh. Um, and on x-rays, we could see that a bullet had gone straight through, shattered the bone, cut it in two, and left bullet fragments behind. And he had an entry wound underneath and an exit wound coming out above. So it went pretty much straight through that straight bone? Straight through, yeah. So what did you do initially to treat that wound? First thing we had to do was treat him for pain and for infection. So what we did was we bandaged the wing to stop it moving around too much. We put him onto some fairly heavy duty painkillers um, and antibiotics for a couple of weeks until we were satisfied we had the infection under control. All right, now I've got to ask, I've got a feeling he's got that mask on to keep him yes. calm, is that right? Yes, this is a falconry hood. Um, we put these masks, these hoods on them and it simply allows them to rest and relax. They don't get as stressed because they're not seeing. So it calms Does, them down. Calms them right down. This university animal hospital treats around 1,000 wildlife patients each year, including up to five eagles. The wedge-tailed eagle is the largest raptor in Australia and they are spectacular birds. But sadly, despite being a protected species, sometimes they're persecuted and attacked, just like what happened to Sir Wedgenald here. This feathered patient is in very good hands. Dr Bob is one of two avian or bird specialists in Queensland with plenty of experience and expertise under his belt. So Bob, how is Sir Reginald's healing going? Healing's going probably as well as we'd expected but not as good as we'd hoped. Um, the bone has ended up with a gap between it here that yeah. we are going to have to try and close and there's actually a piece of dead bone in here that's limiting the ability of these two bones to come together. And on top of that, this part of the bone here has pushed up against the radius, the smaller bone, and it's starting to heal to that bone. And if that happens, it's going to limit his ability to move his wrist. Okay, so what is the solution? What are you gonna do? Well, the first thing we're going to do is remove this piece of dead bone and then run a pin down the length of the bone here. And the pin there will keep these two ends aligned with each other and away from the radius. You are amazing. Sounds Only like a big works. operation. It is a big... That's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> all right, now what is his future? If it all goes well and it comes together and he can move his wrist much better, we'll send him off to a wildlife carer who'll be able to rehabilitate him for at least 12 months. He's got to get fit again, fit enough to be released. And strong. And he's got to be tough, capable of sustained flight. Sir Weginald is one tough eagle. He's been through a massive ordeal, but fortunately he's had the very best veterinary care available. Let's hope he has a bright future filled with wild adventures in the great outdoors. Every farmyard has its hero. It may be one of those guys, an animal, or perhaps even a fruit tree or depending on who the person is, it could be the occasional machine. But at this farm, there's some new heroes well and truly on the block. Solar panels. So here on the Sunshine Coast, we have Valdora Solar Farm. It's a site of solar panels on a 24 hectare lot and it's got around 48,000 solar panels on site. Wow, that is absolutely massive, it's yeah? It's huge, yes. <laughs> and it's pretty big in Australia? Uh, it's the largest on southeast Queensland, yes. There you go. So why the Sunshine Coast? Or did I just answer my own question? Well, pretty well. This site needs a lot of sun. Sun powers solar panels, which generates electricity, which is why this site was considered, because it gets a lot of sun. This farm isn't the only place going solar. Over 15% of Australian homes, just like ours, have solar panels. So the benefit 
benefits of a solar farm, this site in particular, is that it's saving carbon emissions, which is the greatest benefit of all, but also we're not impacting our local ecosystem, so the animals are all protected and happy. As you can see, they're flying quite happily over there. They're not being impacted by the panels being on this site. But the benefits also extend out to us as human beings, yeah? Yes, they do. We, well, solar panel generates electricity and they power our swimming pools, our local libraries, all city council power buildings. But how do they do that, I hear you ask? Well, let's break it down. When sunlight hits the solar panels, electricity or solar energy is produced. That energy then runs from the panels into an inverter like this. It then gets sent out onto the local grid through those roadside power lines, and then it's ready to use. Given the simplicity of this technology, large-scale solar plants are still being built right around Australia, with the largest solar plant being in New South Wales. It's quite clear to see that solar is the sustainable way of the future, only requiring our natural resources. Pack your bags. Yes. We're going on an adventure. And not just any kind of adventure, a pirate adventure. To a far off island uninhabited by humans. Welcome to Avoid Island. An island full of treasure more than a few dangers. So avoid island doesn't sound very appealing. It's really hot here but apparently we can't swim in the ocean because there's crocodiles and sharks and jellyfish. You won't find very many regular animals like we're used to but you will find death adders. They're a pretty deadly snake you kind of want to avoid them. Oh and I forgot the death adders. Who are these brave explorers? I'm Mitch from Roma. I'm Sam from Bundaberg. I'm Erin. Josh. Catherine. I'm Tim from Brisbane. I'm Michaela. Katie. Royce. Aloysia. So, what kind of treasure brings a group of strangers to a perilous island with no Wi Fi? The clue is in the tracks you'll find on the beach. These are the markings of a nesting flatback turtle. And Avoid Island is one of the top spots to lay their treasured eggs. The flatback turtle is a very unique species to Australia as it is the only species that is born on Australian shores. This tiny island in the southern Great Barrier Reef is crucial to the species of the flatback turtles as 25% of their population of Queensland nests here. We've come to Avoid Island to help monitor the mothers laying this season. Many of those turtles have already made their journey up the beach, which for the team means there's plenty of work to do marking nests as soon as they hit the ground. Okay, so pull it really tightly. 12 metres, 10 centimetres. Yep, so you can wrap it in there. Okay, we can wrap this back up and we'll move to the next nest. As the sun fades, it's back to camp to pack the all-important kit bags and to fuel up before the intense work begins. Yep, there'll be no sleep for this island slumber party because turtle work happens at night. Flatback turtles lay their eggs up on the shore on either side of a high tide in a five hour window. So that's why for the next five hours we'll be walking up and down this 600 metre stretch of beach waiting for these turtles to arrive. The sun's about to set, and fingers crossed that they're coming out very soon. But the turtles are on their own time, so it's a waiting game. Luckily, this team seems perfectly capable of entertaining themselves. How many do you have? Until... Bobby, we've got a turtle coming up the beach. She's about halfway up on her way up to the dunes. It's time to meet our first flatback. 
Welcome to Avoid Island. It's after sunset on the beaches of Avoid Island. And the team have just spotted their first flatback turtle coming up to nest. So now she's being more active filling in, which means now she's going to whack you in her sh in your shins. It will be 60 days before her eggs hatch, which isn't something mum's waiting around for. So it's back to the sea for her. For the turtle team, however, things are only just warming up on the beach. We've got a second turtle just come up at our end. Could you send the other team up, please? OK, everybody lights off. Here are three, five, six, seven, five. Six, four, six, nine, four. We've got to do the nest map for the first one, and then we've got to do the nest map for this one as well. Three, four, seven, six, seven. Right flipper. The crew is tasked with taking shell measurements, recording microchip numbers, and checking for any injuries. Not that I can see. Oh, a bit, bit of a scarring there. Yeah, a bit there. Yeah, a little bit of a scratch. Yep. So she's got something here, hasn't she? Yeah. It's so you've got to draw that on the on the picture. As well as recording data from the nest once she's gone. We're going to have them, the top ones are going to be in the back, bottom ones will be in the front. That way when we're putting them back, we're kind of putting them back the same way. So we've just finished weighing and measuring our eggs just to collect some information. We've just got to be really, like, really careful with them that we don't like rotate them or anything because we want these ones to turn out really healthy and all well. Such a surreal experience to hold a turtle leg and to know that you've got life inside your hand. It's really cool. My two sticks are nearly, nearly buried there. It's cold, tiring and sandy work. But collecting this information means scientists can track trends and help protect the species into the future. We've just found another up track. I'll just go and check it out and let you know what's happening. So it's quarter to ten and way past our bedtime and we've seen several turtles today, more than a dozen, and we've recorded over seven. I've never seen a turtle in the wild before like, in my whole life. It's such an adrenaline rush, like as soon as you get up there with the turtles, they're way bigger than you expect and you've got to like measure them, you've got to like check their fins tags, you've got to keep them still while they keep them sand in your face. You're flicking sand all over me! It's been so exhilarating tonight, can't wait to go out tomorrow night even though we're all tired and we'll be most likely wrecked in the morning. but. We're eager to get out there again. Morning. It's day two of turtle monitoring on a void. As the team sets off to circumnavigate the island, signs of last night's nesting turtles are up and down the beach giving a feeling of accomplishment to the adventurers. What this program is really all about, it's the Queensland Trust for Nature coming together with Wonder of Science, which is a science outreach program. So we're getting kids from all over Queensland. We've got kids from Roma, Bundaberg, Brisbane. We're all coming together and we're learning about turtle conservation on this island, which is really important. The flatbacks um, that nest here, um, we've been studying them for about six years now. So this program, the kids are really contributing to real world science. We're about to head out for a second night on the beach. We're not really tired, just really excited to see more turtles. After two days, people are really starting to smell, but it's been an awesome adventure. It's been an absolutely great experience seeing the flatbacks out in the wild. Fingers crossed we don't get as much sand in the face as last night. I don't think any of us are going to forget about the turtles after this. Let's go treasure hunting. Hi team, it looks like we just spotted another one coming up. Uh, we're just going to head over there now. At Totally Wild, we love getting up close to our native wildlife. But truth be told, 
Often where wildlife thrives the most is in the remote pockets of our country, the places that humans just don't go. Off the coast of Queensland in the southern Great Barrier Reef is one such place. Welcome to Avoid Island. So there's no power, there's no um, buses or trains or transport or anything, there's no humans here, there's not a lot of habitat. The only way to get here in, is a, in a tiny plane. So you can walk around the island in just a couple of hours, it's only 86 hectares, there's not a lot going on here. Yep, it sure is small and doesn't have a very welcoming name. But its role in the lives of some Aussies is priceless. This island is home to six threatened species. Um, they like it here because it's so remote and it's a much safer place for them to live. None more so than the flatback turtle. And when the sun goes down on a void, they start to appear. Avoid Island is um, habitat for 25% of the eastern Queensland population of flatback turtles. Um, so these turtles lay about 10,000 eggs here each season. Um, so it's really critical nesting habitat for them. The Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is dotted with islands from north to south. So what makes Avoid Island the best choice for these turtles? The reason that turtles have chosen Avoid Island as a key nesting spot is because it's got really good eastern facing beaches, the slopes are right, but most importantly it's really remote. So it doesn't have all of those threats that the mainland turtles face. So it doesn't have light pollution, um, housing developments near the coast, um, predators like pigs and foxes and dogs. So the turtles that come here are really safe and have a really good chance of, of nesting successfully. Avoid Island is now protected land, where scientists and conservationists can come and learn more about this unique species. The importance of protecting these remote habitats cannot be overstated. If you can preserve the habitat, then you can protect the animal so that we can continue to study and learn from them into the future. That's something we can get on board with. Here at TW, we like to keep things as wild as possible. We're guessing you've heard of a kangaroo, most definitely a possum, a koala, absolutely, and a dunnart. Have you heard of a dunnart? What's a dunnart? Have you heard of a dunnart? A dunnart? No, I haven't. Have you heard of a dunnart? A dunnart, kind of hot dog, isn't it? This is a dunnart, and what a cutie. This little carnivorous marsupial often flies under the radar when it comes to our Aussie natives, but here they're back in the spotlight. Delene, these are very special little creatures, aren't they? Absolutely. How are they settling into the wildlife centre? They're doing brilliantly. On the very first night that we moved these guys, we had a mating observation, which means they're doing their normal thing. They're just acting like they were never moved. So when they're not stressed, obviously, they do. They act naturally. And what they do do very well, I know, is breed. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so now, when does it all start to happen for a dunnart? So, Girls can be first mated when they're 120 days old and boys at 150 days old. This guy, he's Bob, he's my favourite. Oh. We put him in um, with a bunch of females at 150 days old. 16 days later, he had pouch young. Amazing, look at you go. Which is <laughs> exceptional, he loves the ladies. I can tell you love him. <laughs> he's my favourite. <laughs> now tell me, why are you breeding them here? We're breeding them so that we can do some studies on brain development. They breed really quickly, they're really easy to house, and they make an excellent model for other species. Hey! Spreading their genes is not the only superpower these meat-eating marsupials are hiding. When food is plentiful, they'll stock up and store fat in their fat tails. It's a backup for when food is scarce, much like a camel and its hump. This is a beautiful full tail. What's on the menu for such a tiny animal? So these guys get cat kibble, 
and sunflower seeds, they get that all day long, every single day. They also get a couple of mealworms as a bit of enrichment because that's what they eat out in the wild. This tail almost looks like a mealworm. Look at it wriggle. <laughs> that is a good looking tail. It is, absolutely. So it's, this dunnart is in particularly good condition. In the wild, dunnarts will munch on crickets, beetles and moths and sometimes they'll even take on small reptiles. They're voracious predators and can be quite aggressive. Well, you have 111 beautiful little fat-tailed dunnarts to look after here at the Wildlife Centre, but how do they all get along? They're actually quite a social species, but we house them in individual enclosures for management purposes, so we know what their genetics are doing. All right, sounds like a plan. So you've obviously got also, you know, when there are babies, you've got mothers and their babies. When you're trying to breed, you put the males with the females, like Bob, I must, he must love that. He does, he does, and they can have up to four females with one male. All right, but you don't want to put two males in together? No, we keep the males separate because they'll fight when they're females in the picture. Of course, the dunnarts are a part of what happens here at the Wildlife Centre in the bigger picture. Absolutely. The Hidden Vale Wildlife Centre, we not only breed these guys for research, but they're also here um, as part of teaching. So wildlife students can come in and have hands-on experience with these guys. Conservation of this unique species is the main aim and today we've been very lucky to get an insight into a creature that most of us have never seen in the wild, let alone even heard of. Vets and vet nurses are crucial to the well-being of our precious pets, whether big or small, feathered or hairy. They carry out regular checks to prevent problems from developing and fix all kinds of injuries and illnesses. If I hadn't have become a ranger all those years ago, a career as a vet or a vet nurse would have been right up my alley and this would have been a fantastic place to learn all the practical skills. Welcome to this clinical skills hub where university students fine-tune everything they'll need in the real world of a veterinary practice. Hey Fran, it's lovely to see you. Tell us about this hub. Well, this is a new part of University of Queensland's uh, vet school and this is a place where on top of all the theory that our vet and vet nursing students learn, they can also come and practice their clinical skills as much as they need to to feel confident. And there are no live animals here? No, so this is a fabulous facility because the students, just like when you're learning to ride a bike, you have to practice it over and over before you feel confident. Our students can now practice their clinical skills as much as they need to without using live animals. And I guess the upside is they're very well behaved patients. They mostly stay exactly exactly where I put them, so. <laughs> Vets have to deal with a diversity of species from horses to crocodiles, and that's all part of the vet school experience. Thanks for that, just need to finish up this last part to make sure the bandage stays in place so when the horse is running around, don't want it to slip off. A range of stations are positioned in the hub to simulate typical vet clinic scenarios. Everything from examining parasites and blood samples through microscopes to prepping for surgery. Well, Eddie, this patient looks like he's ready to go. What have you learned? And I must say, you are totally looking the part, even with the beard cover. What have you learned about prepping for surgical procedures? So we've learned that there's a special technique and a particular order that you need to do your prepping for surgery. Um, and the main thing is to try and keep the level of bacteria as low as possible. So we want to keep it as sterile for the patient. I've got to say, putting on a pair of gloves has never looked so awkward. <laughs> no, it's definitely not easy, but it's definitely worth the part just for the patient's well-being. All right, now, and in general, the Hub, how have you found it in your training? The Hub's absolutely fantastic because it allows us to practice all our clinical skills that we wouldn't be able to do um, outside in the real world um, before we get there. So. Being able to practice now where we can make mistakes and then we get out the real world, we can do it properly. Okay, well this fur patient is totally in your hand. He is, hands. and hopefully hands. Your gloved hands. Double hands, yes. Okay, mask on. Now, if you've ever wondered how sutures are applied, look no further. The students spend hours practicing the technique before they go anywhere near a real live animal. Jade, this suturing looks really tricky. 
Yeah, it is a bit more complicated than just doing your average cross stitch. <laughs> okay, so what do you have to keep in mind when you're doing it? Um, so to do surgery, we really have to practice how we hold our instruments because there's a particular way and um, even just like the different techniques of suturing. And what about this, that some of the materials you're using, this is quite interesting. You're, it looks like there's a cut there that you're using to suture. Yeah, so this is like a, like a fake skin um, that yeah, we just practice suturing wounds with. Before you do the real thing. Yeah. With training like this, our pets are in good, not to mention meticulously clean hands with these vets and vet nurses of the future. This is a serious looking facility, super sized and architecturally designed. And there's serious work going on inside. It's a brand new wildlife centre with a couple of main focuses, conservation and learning. And we've been offered a personalised tour. There's so much more to discover about our native animals. And as we know, many species face threats out in the wild. So let's find out what's happening here to help them. Lovely to see you, Andrew. What's the aim of this facility? Well, it's a captive breeding and management facility, particularly for aimed at endangered species local to the area, that's South East Queensland. But in so doing, we might also be doing uh, work with uh, uh, common species, so we can apply that to the more endangered species later on. Fantastic. Now, I've got to say, this giant aviary, I haven't seen many aviaries this big. Tell us about some of the features. Yeah, well, it's multi-species. We can have ground-dwelling animals, we can have climbing animals, we can have flying animals, anything we like in here. So we can have birds, reptiles, mammals. It's got uh, a red light there for nighttime viewing, for watching behaviour. It's got an automatic sprinkler system for keeping the place nice and green and so nothing dies. So it really has been built with a lot of thought for the future. Even though the centre is in its early stages, it's already home to a few unique species. Cute little fat-tailed dunarts are bred and monitored to learn more about brain development. In case you've never come across a dunart before, it's a carnivorous marsupial. And then there are the mahogany gliders. So Stacey, this is one of our mahogany gliders, Laws, its name is. Laws, absolutely beautiful. And getting into that mealworm, they've mm. got a voracious appetite, don't they? They do, yes, certainly. And although this is the middle of the day sort of thing, and they're normally nocturnal, yes. they are still hungry. So inside, I should be rather quiet, but inside these nest boxes, that's where they sleep through the day, right? That's right, yes. Wow, and now the research that's happening here, what are you actually looking at in terms of mahogany gliders? Because they are very endangered. They are, yes, and they're part of a captive breeding program, not for release, but so we have a sustainable captive population. And also we're doing some work at the moment on, with these on uh, the stress of these. They've moved from a, a previous enclosure across to our new aviaries here that are much bigger, and we want to see how they adapt and how their behaviour changes in these great big enclosures we've got. Well, I must say, little laws here doesn't look too stressed out at the moment. No, that's right. <laughs> These pretty-faced marsupials are endangered and in the wild only live in a very small area of North Queensland known as the wet tropics. Each day, university students come here to gain practical knowledge. In the high-tech surroundings, there's hope there'll be a high rate of conservation successes. Hey Jenny, nice to see you. I must say you and Larissa have been very, very busy today. Why is a place like this so important for conservation and learning? I think, uh, especially for people like ourselves, but for, for everyone, the opportunity to do the research and for what we learn, it's, um, it's just so important for the conservation of our native species. Because we do have so many unique species in Australia. Yes, we do, like extremely unique species. And we've seen a couple so. today. Yes, yes we have, yeah. What Thank do you think about working with such amazing, cute animals like the mahogany gliders and the dunnarts? It's such a great opportunity, really, to have that hands-on experience and to really get to know the personalities of the animals. It really makes you much more driven to do what you're doing. This vet hospital may look a little different to the one you visit when you take your cat or dog for a checkup. It's a little larger, perhaps some extra high-tech equipment. 
This is an equine hospital. It's been specially designed and fitted out to take care of horses just like Cartouche here. And today we're joining a small group of vet students who are getting some hands-on experience to deal with some rather large patients. quite like putting all of that knowledge into practice. As well as getting up close and personal with adult horses, there just so happens to be a few foals in the paddocks. Time for a health check. Alison, it's great to see you. What's actually involved in the physical examination of the horses and their foals? Well, every day they get inspected just to make sure everybody's happy and healthy, um, that they're all standing up, no one's lame, nobody's colicking, and then periodically we'll bring the students down and they can practice their physical exam skills. We'll listen to their hearts, the respiratory rates, take their temperatures, check their feet, oh. um, and just making sure everybody hasn't put on any weight or lost weight. There's actually a lot to it and the girls out here today, Riley, Kate and Molly, they're quite advanced in their studies, aren't they? Yes, they're all fifth year students, so they're going to graduate in about six months time. Wow, and it is certainly a challenge, something that is wonderful to learn in the field because I must say the foals are very inquisitive and uh, can be quite naughty sometimes. Oh yes, they're very, very cheeky. <laughs> um, they, they haven't been weaned yet, they're still on their mothers and they're four to five months old. They've had no official handling yet, but you can see they love being padded. and. and they I love being around people. <laughs> Not far from the paddock is the hospital, equipped with cutting-edge technology to diagnose and treat these beautiful animals. And that includes a high-powered x-ray machine. Hey Sasha, would a horse need to have an x-ray for the similar reasons that we may need to get an x-ray? Yeah, definitely. If they've fractured a bone or broken a bone, goodness, or they've uh, been injured in any way, or even sometimes if they have colic. So that's a big tummy ache, isn't it? Yeah, colic is just pain in the colon, and it can be from anything. It could be from accidentally eating some sand or chewing on a hay net and swallowing it. Oh, not good. So we can bring them in here to our x-ray room and we can take radiographs of the abdomen to see if we can find out what the problem is. And part of your job as a vet nurse here is pretty much showing these students exactly how it's done. Definitely, hands-on experience is the best thing I feel for the students here. Like they can learn to move the plates and the buckies, um, give injections. They are responsible for looking after their patients and I think it's just invaluable for them. And that's their future. Definitely, they're gonna go out there into the wide, wide world and be vets and then teach other people and I think it's really great that it all starts here. Well, the horses and foals have passed the health checks today with flying colours and these future vets have gained so much. Hey Kate, it must be very cool having these beautiful horses right here on campus. Yeah, it's amazing, like to get the practical experience and I love horses. Well, they love you and I must say, I think they love all of us. They're very, very inquisitive and just so... <laughs> Oh, hello, sorry. <laughs> and so beautiful. I just got a kiss. Now, I know as a vet, you have the chance to work with so many different animals. So horse is one you'd like to specialise oh, in? Oh, definitely. They're my passion and I would love to do an internship and specialise. So that's the dream? That's the dream. Well, it could become reality. You're very close. I'm very close. Hey Wilders, right now I am walking in 775 hectares of conservation area and among all of this forest we are looking for one thing, cockatoos. And not just any, we are talking glossy black cockatoos. I think we're going to need some help on this little search mission. Enter Daniella, she's a cockatoo tracking extraordinaire. Daniela, how are you so good at finding these inquisitive little guys? Well, I have been studying them for quite a few years okay. um, as part of my research because they are endangered in, um, this, in this region and they are a threatened species. Um, so I do know what they sound like and I know what to look for when we're in a forest. So we listen out for them and we look for their, the signs that they've been feeding in that area, which is um, the cracked cones of the she-oak trees. So that's how we know they've been there. They do come back to the same spots regularly, so we, you know, it is reliable to kind of come back to the same areas and we know that they'll be there. Lucky for us, this area is a cockatoo hotspot. 
although there's no guarantee that we'll see any today. So Danielle has created a new way to collect data without actually seeing them. So this is a sound recorder and it's got this little microphone here. So all we need to do is strap this to a tree and then that will record what goes on at the nest. So it will tell us when the birds are there and what they're doing and from that we can figure out um, if they're breeding well. Wow, that is impressive technology, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's really cool and it's new technology. This is, uh, you know, the latest technology. And so it gets sent back to your computer or? No, that would be ideal. Uh, that would make my life a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I have to come out and collect them and then bring the data back to my computer and then go through it manually and listen for their sounds. And that is a fair bit of commitment because how much are you recording each day? Yeah, it's quite a lot. So somewhere between three and eight hours every day, depending on where the birds are and what they're getting up to. So it's, yeah, a lot of listening for me. So not that much social life, just 100% uh, on the birds? Just birds. That's, that's my life birds here. 24/7. <laughs> it's a pretty genius idea because getting data on birds in the wild is mega hard. Kind of like searching for a needle in a haystack. Planting microphones to hear them 24/7 is much easier. So the whole aim of this research is to figure out where they're nesting and how well they're nesting. So from the sounds that they make, we'll be able to tell if they're there and whether they actually raise a chick successfully. And then once we know that, we can know that that area should be protected and hopefully boost the population a bit. Well, they are a threatened species and they're on the decline and we don't really know why. So my research is trying to help answer that question. So hopefully, if we can get some answers, we might be able to secure their future a bit better. Okay. Well, let's keep researching that. Yeah. Dr Zoe and I are in precious eastern bristlebird habitat. You can hear their beautiful call, but that doesn't mean we'll see them because these mysterious songbirds are masters of disguise. Don't expect to see these birds perched in trees or flying high above. The cool thing about bristlebirds other than their great voices, is that they're mostly flightless and they rely on very different habitat to your average bird. Dr Zoe has been studying that habitat for the last four years. So the eastern bristlebird liked really dense understory vegetation. So in the north, where we're talking about the northern population, it really likes grassy, thick, tussocky habitat. You can see this like is this. kind of perfect. You've got really nice clumping tussocks. So that's when they grow from like a single shoot rather than spread out like a normal lawn. Um, really tall, really thick, so it keeps it nice and protected from predators and it yeah, can just good hidey holes. Go, <laughs> go about its business. <laughs> yeah. So why are these birds so precious? The, the eastern bristlebird is um, endemic to Australia, so it means it's only found in Australia, so it's really important for Australian biodiversity. Um, it's also uh, endangered, so on the national level, there's only about 3,000 birds left. Wow. So there's really not a lot of them left, so we have to look after them. And in the north, so the subspecies that we're talking about, there's only 40 birds left so, so that's a critically endangered species we have to look after. Wow well lucky you're here so like one they're hard to see because there aren't many of them left here two they're hard to see because they're quite well camouflaged birds aren't they? Yeah so the eastern brown bristlebird is a brown bird we call it a little brown job um, it's about this big lives on the ground so it's semi-flightless it doesn't fly very well so it's running along the ground underneath this grass so you don't get to see it yeah. at all I mean you can't even see our feet so you're not <laughs> you're not gonna see a small little bird they may not have the splendid color of some of our more famous natives but they're actually pretty cute and we're lucky enough to know exactly what they look like due to a breeding program currently underway to raise their numbers in captivity so we've got a breeding program that has about 16 birds in it and we want to get that up to 30 birds at least so we can start re releasing them into the wild. So what have you found out on your field work out here? Yeah, so before we release those birds we need to know that the habitat's okay. So is there enough food? And are the threats dealt with? So that's fire. So, um, or lack of fire in this instance actually. 
Well, so what does that mean, a lack of fire? So a lack of fire, so this bristle birds, we, I found um, studying the vegetation that they really need this thick grassy habitat and that we've actually lost 50% of this habitat because we don't have enough fire in this ecosystem. Is, is the fire kind of controlling other plants that are growing over the grassy area? Yeah, so this is, this habitat occurs next to the rainforest. So the rainforest, it's nice and wet, um, plants grow really quickly. So what we need is we actually need quite frequent fire to stop these rainforest plants and weeds like these acacias from shading out the grassland. People think fire is bad most of the time, but, but it's actually really important for a range of species, not just the bristle birds. We are definitely on board with any effort to help these songbirds keep on singing. Next time you're in this kind of habitat, listen out for them. They might be closer than you think. Building your dream home by the water, eating fresh seafood every day seems like the perfect life. And for the native water mouse, that's exactly what they like to do. This vulnerable little nocturnal rodent builds its nest in salt marshes and mangrove areas. But their habitats are under threat. So researcher Nina has been keeping a careful eye on them for the past seven years. Now Nina, you have been studying this elusive animal in this area for quite a long time now, amongst all the mosquitoes and with gumboots on. I guess the question is, why? Why have you been doing that? Because they're a protected animal, they're protected under the EPBC Act and they're listed as vulnerable, so they're only one step away from being endangered. Okay, but most importantly, oh, Nina? they're the most cutest animals <laughs> that you'll ever see. Definitely agree. Look at that little face. But despite the muddy, watery habitat around us, the water mouse isn't a great swimmer. So why the waterside home? This is a really smart place to live. They've got heaps of uh, abundance of food source through here and it's in a really nice healthy wetland habitat. So in this area alone we've got red finger marsh crab, they love it. So little small crabs, no bigger than this, as well as um, shellfish, crustaceans, um, mollusk and flatworms. This mouse builds a nest and it's not your run-of-the-mill ho-hum, whatever pile of sticks, oh no. We are talking five different sophisticated designs. So we've got several types of nests, so this one's a freestanding, we've also got what uh, they build a tree nest as well as a bank nest, anywhere where it's up nice and high. It protects them from the intertide so at night time they'll come out on the receding tide because they are nocturnal so that's when they do all their night their activities. They come out, they do a bit of nest, nest maintenance and then they take off and go look for that beautiful fresh seafood. What are they actually made out of those nests? Sure, um, so this nest is actually made out of mud and that's the primary source that they use. So if you think about a bricklayer when he's using mortar, he's got to have something nice and strong to put all the, the other materials together. Now I have to ask, the mice are about yay big, yeah, am I right? That's about right, yeah. Okay, and these nests are massive, why is that the case? Well they build them to this side and this standard, but to accommodate their family members. So this size nest may house up to maybe five mice. But over my seven years of research, I've actually found that a nest this big has about two or three mice in it. With water mouse numbers in decline, now more than ever, they need a stable environment to survive. Plus, these little guys form part of the connection between land and sea ecosystems. Nina, how many little mice will be emerging from the dwellings tonight? Well, based on um, the research and the camera observations for the last seven years, they've estimated about 350 to 500 just for the Marici River system alone. Wow, that is not yeah. much. I thought you were actually going to say more than that. No, they're not like your normal, typical introduced species of um, rat. They only have an estimated lifespan of about five years and maybe two to three times a year they'll actually breed. Wow, and what are the other troubles facing them? The other troubles that they're really getting hammered by at the moment are foxes as well as cats and pigs that actually dismantle their nesting structures and make it very difficult for them to survive. But it's also our actions um, in adjacent land as well. So these little natives need our help. If you do see a mound on a mangrove wall, leave it be and let parks and wildlife know it's there. That way the water mouse will be building nests long into the future. Paleontology, it's such a great word. And the meaning is very cool too, the study of fossils. 
paleontologists are dedicated to finding out what life on Earth was like millions and millions of years ago. So what are we waiting for? Let's go and meet one. Dr. Kayleen Butler's field of expertise is ancient kangaroo species. Yep, believe it or not, our modern day marsupials have a very long history. Kayleen, I must admit, it's not every day we get to meet a paleontologist, a real life paleontologist. Is this something you've always wanted to do? Actually it is. I wanted to be a paleontologist ever since I was a little three-year-old girl and I sat down and I watched Jurassic Park and I thought, that, I want to study that. Wow, so you're not so much into dinosaurs those, these days though. Yeah. What can you tell us about ancient kangaroos? So this is Balbaru Fangaroo, and that's his real name, and it's because he has these really large fangs at the front. That is amazing, yeah. and it's quite a small part of a skull, isn't it? Exactly, so these wouldn't have been any bigger than a small kangaroo or a wallaby. And of course they wouldn't have come in bright blue. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and whereabouts did they live and how long ago? Uh, so Fangaroo actually lived in a place called the Riversley World Heritage Area up in northwestern Queensland. Between 25 and around 10 million years ago was the last time we see fanged kangaroos. The real fossil of this very old macropod is kept safely in a museum facility and has been perfectly preserved under controlled conditions. Through Kayleen's research, she's been able to study the fossils and create 3D printed versions to compare to our modern day species. I'm totally intrigued by these fangs. You know, knowing that our kangaroos and wallabies of today are herbivores, do you think this one would have been a carnivore? So these weren't actually carnivores. It's not the front teeth or the fangs that tell you about diet. It's actually the back teeth. So when we think about humans that exist today or kangaroos that exist today, they actually chew with their back teeth, not the front ones. So what do you think the fangs may have been used for? So it looks like the fangs were most likely used either to dig up fungi in the ground or um, they may have been something that the males had in order to fight with each other and compete. So what about the way it would have moved or its gait? So based on leg and arm bones that we have for these fossils, it actually looks like they weren't hoppers like the kangaroos we think about today. They're actually scurriers and tree climbers, kind of like a tree kangaroo. Kangaroos are one of our top iconic Aussie native animals. Their background is like a deep, dark family tree that Kayleen is working to unearth and dig down to the roots. So my research was really trying to understand why an entire family of fanged kangaroos went extinct around 10 million years ago. Because at the time, the ancestors of modern kangaroos actually increased in numbers and didn't go extinct. So why do you think they died out? So it looks like there was actually a very significant shift in climate from rainforest to woodland and then the big open grassland we see in northern Queensland today. But at the same time, it looks like they were competing with the ancestors of modern kangaroos for resources and the modern kangaroos simply won out. It is so fascinating, isn't it? It really is. <laughs>